What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Monday, and welcome to Rant TNH. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and today uh, we're going to be jumping into uh, the best everyday watch for about $20,000. Let's do it. Okay, before we jump into this, you know, ultra value packed purchase at $20,000, which I mean, is that even a thing? Uh, we'll do a quick wristwatch check. Uh, I am wearing one of the watches that is gonna go live tomorrow on theoandharris.com. Um, this is a Rolex reference 16014 date just. Uh, it features a quick set date. It features a flawless white Buckley dial uh, named after a legendary watch collector uh, by the name of Buckley. So let's get into my exploration now. So first off, let me start off by saying uh, $20,000 is a lot of money, you know, and, and I feel, you know, anecdotally, for many of the people that I know that do spend this kind of money on watches, it seems to be a price range that people really, really want to squeeze every dollar out of. And I don't blame them at all. Um, whereas when you go further up the ladder, once you're getting into 50, 60, 70, $80,000, you know, it almost becomes arbitrary. Really, how can you tell if a $70,000 watch uh, is worth 40 or 90? So there, there comes this point where it's all uh, very hard to pinpoint, you know, value points. Uh, but at twenty thousand dollars, you have some pretty good core, you know, points of reference here. Uh, you're just under uh, the entry for the Nautilus by Patek Philippe. You're above many of the Royal Oaks by Adamar Piguet, uh, and still below uh, the the more premier Royal Oaks from the same company, the fifteen two hundred two, for example. You're in complicated territory with brands like Georges Lecoultre. So there's a lot going on, and I think that this twenty thousand dollar range is like a real hot action point. Whereas we've explored in the past that 10 to 15,000 is almost a little bit soft, you know? And that's not to say that it's just because it's less money because the five to $8,000 range is hot as well. So it, there, there are just these odd points of jumping to the next level and there being awkward space. But at this point, this $20,000, there is value. So let's go into my, my first discovery. The Patek Philippe Aquanaut, uh, a watch that was introduced in the late 90s. So it's not necessarily a heritage model uh, by Patek, one of the you know greatest heritage companies in the history of wristwatches. But it really is, at least in my opinion, a truly valuable watch. The Aquanaut, particularly the, the current production reference 5167, um, really does pack so much of the value uh, of the Nautilus. It has the brand heritage. You know, it has Patek Philippe, one of the most important, you know, watchmakers of all time. Uh, it has a movement that's finished, in my opinion, I mean, at least seemingly to an equal and tremendous degree. Uh, it's a beautiful yellow gold kind of like decadent full swinging rotor as opposed to the Nautilus's micro. But really, I mean, is that really much of a trade-off? I mean, is the movement in the Nautilus any, you know, technically better than this? Uh, sure, in the Nautilus you do get the bracelet, whereas in the Aquanaut, uh, rubber straps are standard issue. But is that really a problem? Uh, I don't think so. I think that that is precisely what gives the Aquanaut, uh, you know, the Aqua, it makes, it's what makes it the Aquanaut um, in, in a funny way. I mean, the same way that the, the Nautilus bracelet makes it the Nautilus, the, the, the Aquanaut rubber strap makes it the Aquanaut, you know, in an equally, well, not equally, but in a comparably iconic way. Uh, I am an enormous fan of this watch. I think it's super underrated. You can have them for around seventeen to $19,000. And considering the entry point for uh, a Patek uh, uh, Nautilus uh, 5711 is a powerhouse of value. Uh, and for people like me, uh, if, you, if you do, if you are like me, uh, you even find it a little bit, you know, more interesting that it's a little bit more of an under the radar, you know, nobody really knows what it is kind of watch. This is the kind of watch that, at least in my opinion or my experience, would go relatively unnoticed. Uh, throughout, you know, social circles. Um, I just love that. Okay, so the next watch I dove into was something on the total opposite end of the spectrum as far as um, style and execution. It's the Master Ultra Thin Perpetual uh, by Gigi Le Colt. This is a tremendous watch. Uh, this watch in steel, uh, which retails in that $20,000 range, and it can even be had closer to the $15,000 mark if you really hunt for them, um, changed at least in my opinion, what a truly fine Swiss perpetual can be. You know, sure, there are there are inexpensive quote unquote perpetual calendars by Federico Constant, for example. And while those watches do serve the perpetual function, I think that they're amazing that they deliver that complication to you know, more people, the masses, at around eight or $9,000. Not only does it bring with it the heritage of Gégé Lecoultre, but I'm sure if you do buy it right, much greater residual value. I can't speak to the durability of the movement from Federico 
Cone Stomp, for example. But I do know from speaking with owners of the Master Perpetual that this is not a dainty, delicate, you know, ultra complicated, don't wear it out of the house kind of watch. Uh, it seems to be pretty robust. Again, I don't own one. I haven't worn one. I've held one in my hands. Um, but these watches are substantial. Uh, so they're more affordable, you know, than the typical perpetual calendars. Uh, for example, the Patek Philippe 3940, which is a grail watch of mine. Um, but you're talking about a fraction of the price. You know, right now, 3940s are in the $40,000 range. And this can be had at 17 or 18, maybe even less. And you're bringing, you know, the same legendary function uh, by another amazing Swiss manufacturer. I think there's something so charming about wearing the watchmaker's watch, there's a lick hold. So that's why uh, this watch made it into my, my final list. But it was upstaged, believe it or not, um, by F.P. Journe in the Chronometro Blue, which is a, a watch that I remember holding for the first time so vividly. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff, I have. Um, and I've, I've seen, you know, uh, 1518s in pink at Phillips. I've seen, you know, De Paul Newman Daytonas. I've seen, you know, crazy longas, you know, a, a lot of stuff. None of it's mine, but I, I've seen this stuff from the resources that we have. And many of the watches blew me away, but, but they came with so much pretense that I expected it almost. Whereas with the Chronometro Blue, it, it kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't really know what it was until I held it. So so as opposed to this massive upcoming event that I'm now realizing, it was something that like just smacked me in the face out of nowhere. And I just remember it. I mean, not only is it cased in tantalum, a totally alternative material, which is not only heavy, but gives off this deep gray gunmetal kind of color. But the dial is incredible. I mean, it's flat, it's extremely reflective, uh, but then there's depth with the subdial and the guilloche. I mean, there really is so much going on with the watch, uh, just on the surface. And then when you flip it over and go to the in-house developed movement by F.P. Journe, a solid rose gold movement, it's incredible. I mean, for, if you don't talk about the actual technicality of the watch uh, for more than a second, even if you just look at it, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful movements you know you could imagine. Take it a step further and put it into contact with other mechanical movements, and you'll find that you've probably never seen anything like it. It's not a better version of existing movements. It's a completely different architecture. So for someone like me that sees movements all the time, this was just, wait, what? What is that? Like, what? What's going on? And of course, someone has to explain it to you that no, the balance is not floating. Uh, it's powered by the train underneath the plate, you know? And, and that is just this super bizarre thing that would go unnoticed uh, if you don't know anything about watches, which is fine. But if you do, it's this super playful, totally unnecessary, you know, variable. Um, but that is exactly, you know, what luxury is. It's, it's, it's making an optical illusion uh, that is totally unnecessary, that has no real function, but is just impressive and enjoyable. And if someone wants to spend the money to enjoy that and be a patron of it, um, they can go ahead. So this watch, which retailed at 20 and now trades in that $17,000, $16,000 range is remarkable. So although I love the Aquanaut and I love the JLC, truly, I, I you know, nothing against them. The Chronometro Blue by F.P. Journe is a masterpiece in both originality and execution. Frankly, tying it back into this everyday watch idea, my answer remains the same. Uh, the, Aquanaut, the Aquanaut is incredible, and can you wear it with a suit? Uh, we'll ask George Soros. It's, it's definitely a dress watch. Can you wear it casually? For sure, throw it on a suede strap, and I'm, I'm sure you can. It takes all of the bones of a traditional design and completely reinvents it. Makes it this daring, little bit of an F you to like the rules and the status quo, which to me has a casual kind of vibe to it. You know, it's like Ralph Lauren wearing a tuxedo on the top, cowboy boots on the bottom, in a weird way. You know, it's the meeting of the world. Anyway, so that's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Rant Teenage. If you liked the watches that I brought up just now, please give us a thumbs up. If you don't already subscribe to our channel, please do that as well. Thank you guys so much again. We will see you all tomorrow.